Latter-day Peace Studies is produced by peace-loving members of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Any views expressed herein are not to be taken as official positions of the Church or its authorities. Latter-day Peace Studies presents Come Follow Me. I'm Christopher Hurtado. And I'm Ben Peterson. Thank you for joining us as we discuss this week's reading of Come Follow Me as outlined by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Our hope is that as we discuss the scriptures, we will come to a more perfect understanding through experiencing the atonement of Jesus Christ and find greater peace in our lives. Well, Ben, here we are at the end. It's been two years, right, going through the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, now the New Testament. We've come to the end of the book of Revelation. We're going to cover this book in one episode. Uh, The church has divided it up in the Come, Follow Me curriculum into three episodes. We're going to cover it in one. And by the way, that's interrupted by Christmas. We are going to cover first a history of the interpretation of this text. I know that's a lot. That really is a lot, but we're going to give that a summary. Then we'll give some historical context for the text, where it comes from. We'll talk about genre. We'll go into the authorship and dating of it, its canonical status, and then we'll go into some themes and symbolism, and then a summary. And in our summary, we'll take the opportunity as we see fit to discuss symbols and, well, those same themes and symbols that we're going to mention before we go into the summary, right? And then we'll end with our own considerations. So another thing that reminds me of is some of the things that we've done to prepare that I want to go into a little bit to share with uh, with the listener and a couple of books, you know, I want to mention. And I have to say, Ben, I'm feeling calm, cool and collected. And that was not the case before pre-show discussion. <laughs> and when yeah. I say that was not the case before pre-show discussion, I don't just mean tonight. Uh, I mean, the last we've been working on this for a couple of weeks, right? Preparing for this for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Actually, we've been preparing for this for the last two years, right? We've been preparing for this all our lives, Christopher. <laughs> That's right. Ben. No, I mean, really, so th- this book, you know, this is the the bookend to the the Bible, right? The the book we well, the library we call a book. That's the Bible, right? Mm-hmm. It, it's going to refer back to Genesis. We're certainly going to refer back to Genesis, right? I mean, we have to. It's, it's Revelation. That's how it works. And so I just want to mention some of the things that we've done to prepare and mention a couple of books that I think are worth looking at. We both went through Armageddon, what the Bible really says about the end by Bart D. Ehrman, right? Yeah. It's his, this is his newest book, right? It is. It was just published a couple months ago or so. Yeah, you brought it to my attention. I'm glad you did. I mean, I make it a point to read all of his books, but I didn't know about this one until you brought it to my attention. So thanks for that. You went through it a couple of times, right? I did. And I've also listened to a bunch of his lectures that are on great courses, another couple of his books. He is really excellent. I think among his peers, he is considered one of the top New Testament scholars right now. So yeah, he's very well respected. I, I pointed out in another episode that he he does get cited a lot in the book I mentioned that um, that debunks the great apostasy, right? The book from the Maxwell Institute. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that book is Ancient Christians: An Introduction for Latter Day Saints from the Maxwell Institute. That's right, Ancient Christians. The other book I read in preparation for this podcast is The Millenarian World of Early Mormonism by Grant Underwood, and that's published by University of Illinois Press. And that was really insightful for me. I sent you a lot of my commonplaces while I was reading that. and You did. <laughs> I did, yeah. All through uh, Thanksgiving break, right? And you, you said uh, that you didn't really, it wasn't new to you, right? Most of this information wasn't new to you. But there were a couple of surprises. Yeah, you know, I, I I grew up in this. I grew up in the cultural milieu of Mormon thought. And what I didn't know at the time was millenarianism, so to speak, right? This, right. this idea, this understanding of end times, of eschatology that has come to be within you know, Mormon culture. And so a lot of the things that you uh, mentioned uh, 
were were not new information to me as far as this is what different authorities maybe have said throughout church history about the end times, the what we call latter days, right? And and how that concept sort of has formed and evolved and taken shape within the community. You know, maybe this is a good time to say when it comes to Revelation, the book of Revelation and its interpretation, whether within or without the Latter-day Saint uh, tradition, it's complicated. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And, and it varies a lot, right? From, from time to time, from person to person, and even... Even sometimes looking at Joseph Smith, right, that the way he understood it, you can see it develop as you read through this book and or in your own experience, Ben, you know this too. Absolutely. And, you know, you say it's complicated. I think the tendency might be from for someone to infer from that that you mean interpreting revelation is complicated. And I think more what you mean and what I would understand that to mean now isn't necessarily that the symbolism itself is complicated or or necessarily uh, very difficult but what is complicated is all the variations of the interpretation and how they have affected and been affected by history so the historiography of that if we will yes indeed i i wholeheartedly agree i don't think that the symbols are actually that hard to understand and you know they really go back to well, not even just to Genesis, but to the myths where Genesis comes from, right? To the Mesopotamian myths before Genesis, to Genesis, to Exodus, to Daniel, Ezekiel, Second Thessalonians, right? It's all there. It is, and it's all couched in the the historical context of the Christianity within the first century and and Roman rule and greek culture and jewish apocalyptic literature and genre right that's right as a matter of fact you know scholars nowadays we discovered are leaning more and more toward thinking of this as more of a jewish text the book of revelation Mm. is more of a jewish text they're saying than it is christian and that's really interesting that's sort of cutting edge scholarship right there you know ben there's one other thing i was going to mention that is When it comes to the millenarian world of early Mormonism by Grant Underwood, that's a book I picked up in grad school. I studied terrorism studies in grad school, and I was writing my honors thesis on the white horse prophecy from the Latter-day Saint tradition until I realized I couldn't do it objectively because I was an apocalyptic millenarian Mormon. Hmm. And so that that was that. That's when I shifted gears, and I and I had I had hold up. Uh, the summer in, in the middle of my two years in grad school in Park City and was just reading up on this stuff. I didn't get through this book, but I did do a lot of reading and uh, visiting Shiloh down in Provo, Shiloh Logan, the co-founder of Latter-day Peace Studies, and playing Words with Friends. That's what I was doing. And I ended up writing on the philosophical presuppositions of Islamist totalitarianism instead. That's a different I am thing. no longer an apocalyptic. <laughs> that's right. It really is. I, I no longer identify as an apocalyptic millenarian Mormon. Uh, so th- what about you, Ben? Well, that's an interesting thing to, to ask because before really getting into this, particularly when I read Ehrman's book, uh, Armageddon, a few months ago, and then again, I just, that was never a title that I knew existed, right? I didn't really understand what that would have meant. If you asked me if I'm that, I'm like, I don't know. But sort of going back, I could say, yes, that has been a worldview that I've had, but it has evolved over time, right? And I can't say that there's like one day that I woke up and I was no longer that, right? Um, I think that there are things, influences from that worldview that will either always be with me or are still with me now. And so I don't know that I'm necessarily abandoned those views in totality. It's just that understanding more what they are and what they imply and what they mean has allowed me to really process it more and and understand the implications of it. So What I hear there, Ben, is nuance, and I hope that's what we're able to bring to this (laughs) conversation. Yeah, it's there, complicated. there's a lot of nuance. <laughs> it's complicated, yeah. And so I hope that we can bring that out in a way that uh, 
that will have the listener think, right? Okay, so in going into this, right, starting with this history of interpretation, I'm going to start back, I'm actually going to start, I'm not going to start back in the beginning. I'm going to start in the early 1800s. In the early 1800s, in upstate New York, there was a small-time farmer who was reading his Bible, and I'm not talking about Joseph Smith. I'm talking about William Miller. And in 1818, William Miller, reading his Bible, found that the world was going to end, this is his conclusion, in 1843. Now, there were 26 conferences for religious leaders between 1840 and 1844, and 124 conferences for lay people between 1842 and 1843. There were an estimated 50,000 Millerites, and then Miller did revise his date, now, a lot of times when predictions are made about the end and a date is given, they are revised, usually after the date has passed and the end didn't come, mm-hmm. right? In the case of Miller, he actually changed his to 1844 from 1843, his original prediction, before 1843 came. And he did that saying that he hadn't taken into account the the Jewish calendar, right? That he was going with the Roman calendar, and so he made a correction, right? This kind of thing happens. Now, here's what happened, though. By the way, this is happening around about 50 miles from Joseph Smith, and the Mormons and the Millerites were in communication. The fact that Miller could have this prediction and gain a following of 50,000 people, right, means that this wasn't something that was out of nowhere for the people around him, right? They could identify with this idea. And so that includes early Mormons, right? The idea that that the world is coming to an end sometime soon. And of course, that's the way, as we'll see, that it's always read. We're in that time right before the end, whenever and wherever we are in time, right? So what happens after this is really interesting because And social psychologists have been really curious about this because you would think that after these expectations have been frustrated, that the whole thing would just sort of, how should I say it? Just, they would disband and just forget about it, right? Let's not. Yeah, they would give up on their notions. Yeah. Yeah, just give up on this notion that that you can predict the date or maybe even that it's even anytime soon, right? Certainly we wouldn't try to predict the date. What really happens though is usually. And this is something that in the 50s, uh, there was a UFO cult study. Some scholars wanted to, they actually infiltrated a cult. They wanted to see what happens. They wanted to see the reaction of the people when the UFO doesn't come. And so what happens actually is this idea of cognitive dissonance uh, comes about from the authors of this very study I'm speaking of. They wrote a book called When Prophecy Fails. This is Leon Fessinger, Henry W. Reichen, or Reichen, Stanley Schachter, 1956. And what happens is the people double down. They deal with their cognitive dissonance by doubling down. They say, oh, we made a mistake in the calculation and we figured out now what the real calculation is. And they gain more followers. And so what happened after Miller is 33 groups were spawned by Millerism. Now, some of these groups are still with us. A couple of them are actually familiar to the listener, right? I'm pretty sure everyone's heard of the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists. You've heard of them, right, Ben? Yeah, absolutely. So the latter of these two groups, the Seventh-day Adventists, they then have a spinoff of their own, right? That happens too, right? They're spinoffs from the spinoffs. And one of those spinoffs gives us the Branch Davidians. And from the Branch Davidians comes David Koresh and Waco, Texas. You remember Waco, right, Ben? Yes. I mean, I was pretty young at the time, but it has been talked about since. And there was even a Netflix drama done on it that my understanding is that it was extremely historically accurate, uh, like a docudrama. And I, you know, I hesitate to recommend watching it, but if you're interested in understanding more about this movement and the history of it, then you do need to watch it. It is heart wrenching. I would say I would I would second that for anyone who who isn't familiar with Waco, even those who are familiar, because one of the controversies around Waco was who started the fires, right? Yeah. 
and I, I like the way that this docudrama deals with that because it's it's very nuanced, right? The the question I think wouldn't you say it remains open in the end, Ben? It does. Uh, it remains open, but it is pretty much, I would say, consensus among those who have studied and and have written on this that the aggressiveness of the agencies that we're dealing with this, you know, FBI, ATF, was ultimately what led to the the tragic end even if we we are talking about you know a a group of people that were prepared for violence. Yeah, I would agree with that assessment. I think that's fair. And that that could even be true even if they did set the fires from yeah. from the inside of the compound. Yeah, sure. So what I think the docudrama does a really good job with though and my kids missed this. I watched this with, with my kids and I think they missed this. I had to go back to the beginning, to the first episode after the third. This is a three-part miniseries, about 45 minutes each part, right? Is It actually starts by telling you that David Koresh predicted that his people, the chosen people, of course, he being a Messiah, not the Messiah, not Jesus, right? But another Messiah, that they would have a confrontation with the government that there would be a firefight and that the whole thing would end in a, in a fire, right? That they were going to die in a fire. And that's exactly what happened. And so as they're, as the followers of David Koresh are in this compound and they're getting this pressure from these agencies, these U.S. government agencies you mentioned, they just see what David Koresh telling them was going to happen, happening. And by the way, there were some biblical scholars who were listening, and all of us were listening and watching. Uh, I'm, I'm 54. I'm older than you, Ben. I remember all of this. I mean, you know, it was on the news for 51 days, right? There's this 51-day standoff with these people in this compound in Waco. And I remember uh, reading in Bart Ehrman that there were these biblical scholars that when they heard David Koresh, they understood right away what was going on, right? David, you know, he's from the line of David, and Koresh, which is just an anglicization of Kurush, which is Cyrus, as in yeah. Cyrus the Great, who's also identified in the Old Testament as a Messiah, right? So he was making himself uh, doubly a Messiah, right? And so they asked, they, they called the FBI and they asked to, you know, let us help you. Let us talk to this man. Uh, we speak his language, and we think we can help him see the Bible differently, perhaps. Talk him down, so to speak. Yeah. Like yeah talk him off the ledge, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they were turned down, and what ensued was a disaster. And truly, a disaster. how many people died? 89 people? 80-something, yeah. Some more than 80 people died, yeah. Including many children. So the the Branch Davidians were seeing... Revelation as a text that's about the future. But that's not always the way it was read. As a matter of fact, it wasn't read that way until the French Revolution. But I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning. So you have the author John and his intended audience, which is not us. And he's telling them that these things are going to happen within their lifetime. By the way, if I back up to the Gospels, and when I say back up, I'm, not, I'm just talking about the order of the canon. And not the order of composition, but the order of the canon. Jesus was telling us that, well, I, I don't know if he was saying the second coming, but the end, right, was going to come within the lifetime of the people he was speaking with, right? They, right. they were hearing his voice. Yeah. yeah. And so then John is telling us the same thing. The early Christians, though, they had a little bit different view. As a matter of fact, there's this man named Papias who had a materialistic, what's called a chilliest utopian view. Chilliest comes from the Greek word for a thousand, right? The, the millennium, right? And so then you have, you know, in about 135 CE, you have the epistle of Barnabas, right? One of these apocryphal texts that says the world is going to last 6,000 years. Well, so now people start calculating. This is all very familiar to, to the listener, I think, you know, modern day interpretations they're accumulating all of these historical interpretations, right? So the creation is six days, and then we have that a thousand years is like a day for the Lord. So now it's 6,000 6, years, right? And you and I talked about this uh, in, in a past, a recent episode, right? Then in 180, you get Irenaeus, who's the heresiologist. He shares Papias' materialistic view. But then 
what happens is around 200, you have, you have this man named Hippolytus. He wants to say, you know what? Actually, this thing is not going to happen for about 300 years. So everybody chill, right? It's 300. He says it's going to happen. The end is going to come in 500 CE. His intention, Ben, this is fun because his intention is just to say, I'm just going to put this off far enough into the future that the people here now can stop thinking about this and think about something else. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he actually used the measurements of the arc to calculate the age of the earth. So you have all kinds of things that people do with this text that's that are kind of weird, right? You're going to use the measurements of the arc to calculate the age of the earth. By the time we get to Eusebius, this is the 300, uh, around 300 CE, this is the Christian historian, the, the author of the Historia Ecclesiastica, the history of the church, He's against the Chilius view. Why? Because the Chilius view is this millennium of, of what do you call it? of posh living, right? Of the you know the city of gold and all that. And he just thinks this is wrong. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's very materialistic. He thinks this is wrong for Christians because he has a more aesthetic view, right, of how Christians should be. In 280 CE, so right before you see this, you get Victorinus. He's reading the text in the context in which it is written. This is a good move. This is a move I, I, I often uh, mention, you know, as should be as an important step, right, in reading a text. So for him, he sees Babylon, as, as mentioned in Revelation, is actually Rome, and the beast is Nero. And so he gets those things right. We'll go into that a little bit more, right, Ben? Yeah. And... He also sees, he notices that what's being described in Revelation is not chronological. And we'll go into that too. He's right about all three of those things. Babylon is Rome, the beast is Nero, and the events that are being described are not chronological. The biggest anti-chiliest of them all has to be Augustine. Around 426, he says no. The millennium is actually now. It's already happened. The end, by the way, is a long way off. Right? The millennium is now, and the reason he knows this is because the church is ruling the world. Right, So he says the first resurrection was spiritual, and the millennium, also known as the fullness of time, he's going to call it the fullness of time, is happening in his time. It's now. And the second resurrection is going to be spiritual physical. So whereas the first resurrection was spiritual, the second one would be physical. This is an important distinction that that shows up over and over too, right? The the difference between whether this is something spiritual and symbolic, right? Or whether it's historical and physical and actual in some way, right? So his view actually predominates while other predictions failed. By 1180, I'm jumping from 426 to 1180, we get Joaquim of Fiore, and he gives us three ages. He wants to divide up the, the uh, history of, of the world, right? Into the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. And he's saying the age of the Holy Spirit is near. So first you have the age of Abraham through Jesus. That's the Father. And so the Father's telling you what to do, right? Then you have the Son. And that's about 1260 years, by the way. The second age, he says, who knows? Who knows how long that is? Well, the spiritual Franciscans come along and they're between the 1240s and the 1250s and say, they say the end is going to be in 1260 CE because if the first age was 1260, then the second age also has to be 1260, mm-hmm. you know, 1,260 years. So by 1260 CE, that's the end. So we're getting now into these futuristic interpretations of Revelation, right? Now we're at the French Revolution. In the 1800s, the American Protestants start to move away from Augustine's historical views to this future view. The the Anglican theologians in the 1790s, they say the end is coming in 1798. Why do they say this? Well, Pope Pope Vigilius took full power in 538, add 1260 years to that, and you get 1798. Coincidentally, the Pope was deposed by Napoleon's chief of staff, in that year so he's comparing that to revelations 13 3. so then we have a man in 1799 named lewis way he meets a john way well john and lewis become friends and john wills lewis 
the equivalent in today's dollars of $42 million in 1804. And this John taps into the evangelical interest in Jews returning to Palestine. So the idea of Jews returning to Palestine as some kind of fulfillment of biblical prophecy is something that starts to show up in the 1700s. And as a matter of fact, this man spends a lot of this $42 million in um, what we can call lobbying, right? This is still something that happens. We get the Christian right in America lobbying for Israel or or the or even um, the modern nation state, right? The secular nation state of Israel lobbying the Christian right for money, you know, for support for mm-hmm. Israel as a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. But I'm getting ahead of myself, right? Because uh, one of the one of the leaders of the modern nation state of Israel is going to say, what is the creation of the modern nation state of Israel, but a fulfillment of prophecy, right? So what happens in 1799 is Napoleon's armies actually invade Palestine, and they declare the Jews rightful heirs of the land. So they invade it. They say, this is rightfully the Jews. Now, Lewis Way, again, he uses John Way's $42 million to lobby politicians. American Christians believed that they could produce the millennium, then Jesus would come. So this is, now we get into pre- and post-millenarianism. In pre-millenarianism, things get so bad and Jesus has to come, right? In post-millenarianism, we're going to make a utopia that Jesus can come back to, right? So the the early Americans, the colonial Americans, they thought, you know, this is, what has it been? The, the city on the hill. City right? on a hill, Puritan idea. Yeah, yeah this Puritan idea. So now we're going to, we, we don't need God to do it. We're going to do it. This is very enlightenment like, right? This is enlightenment thinking. We're going to cause this to happen. We're going to bring about the millennium. Jonathan Edwards, 1703 to 1758 writes this uh, book. Every, I think the listeners heard of it. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. I don't I shouldn't say it's book, a sermon. Right? He writes, yeah. Yeah. It's a sermon. Yeah. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. So Edwards brings evangelical Christianity to the fore during the Great Awakening in the 1740s. This is, right, right, we know about the Second Great Awakening. That's when Joseph Smith and the Millerites show up, right? So this is the, the first one, the Great Awakening of 1740s. There's an American preacher in the 1840s. He says, America is, is great, right? So God can bring on the millennium. So I see sort of the, the idea of make America great again. It really goes all the way back to the 1840s when America was so great the Americans said that Jesus could come now, right? Yeah. We've made America's it, we've destiny made is to, is to usher in Jesus, right? Yeah, exactly. So we can get this whole end of the world thing going now, right? In 1830, John Nelson Darby. So now we're getting close to Joseph Smith's time, right? He founds the Plymouth brethren. He insists on biblical literalism. Now this is something new. Uh, Darby says Christ will return twice, once before the apocalypse and again after the millennium. And so Joaquin of Fira's dispensationalism, right, where he gives us these three dispensations, after Darby becomes a premillennial dispensationalism. So those two ideas get combined between Joaquin of Fira and Darby. And now we get into the fundamentalist Schofield reference Bible. This is published in 1909, and it is the best selling English study Bible between 1917 and 1967. That's right before I'm born in 1969, years. Ben. <laughs> 50 years, right? And so what is this Schofield Reference Bible? It's a King James Bible with fundamentalist intros to the books and fundamentalist commentary on key passages. And so this is incorporated in, and spreads Darby's dispensationalism. And in 1833, 1833, Darby invents the idea of the rapture to save Christians from the coming apocalypse. They're going to be raptured. Now, you know where, where he's uh, finding proof text for this, right, Ben? Yeah, we find proof texts of this in Second Thessalonians. Uh, we find a version that is used sometime, uh, sometimes in the Gospels. And we have discussed that and, and explained how it's not talking about the same thing, right? And so we have contextualized these passages and uh, discussed this concept of the rapture. But uh, there is a, a good part of it comes from Second Thessalonians. Yeah, so then there's a split 
over the scriptural rapture, meaning there's a split over whether the rapture is scriptural, right, in 1845. But more actually side with the scriptural rapture over time. There's a series of conferences in Niagara, New York in 1890, and this is in response to Darwin. Remember, in 1859, Darwin published his Origin of Species. And so this, this series of conferences in responding to Darwin is popularizing the rapture in the United States, right? Now, another thing, there's, there are two or three things that are happening that are going to give us a more literal reading of the Bible. So now it's about the future, and it's going to be more literal too. So the first thing is Darwin, right? The second thing is we have to respond to Darwin, right? This is where fundamentalist literal readings of the Bible come from. The second thing is there's a geological understanding of the age of the earth that's happening that that also threatens fundamentalists because it goes against this idea of the earth being 7,000 years uh, in, in total, right? 6,000 years old and the millennium. And then the other thing is historical biblical criticism, right? This is something that has been around since the 17th century, but it actually becomes popularized around this time in the 19th and 20th centuries. And so what we get out of this, these three things in response to Darwin, historical criticism, and geology is the doctrine of biblical inerrancy and literalism, the young earth creation, a literal Adam and Eve, etc. That's all of this comes from this soup. So if the Bible is literal, then nothing John of Patmos, the author of Revelation, prophesies has happened. It must still be coming. This strengthens premillennialism. One more thing happens that, that I want to mention here uh, before we get back to the great disappointment of the Millerites, right? Actually, this is this is after the, the Great Disappointment. So you have World War I and World War II. What World War I and II did, they marked the end of faith in human progress. I mean, you can see why, right? Mm, yeah. I mean, people just said, you know what? <laughs> Never mind this whole idea of, you know, of post-millennialism that we're going to bring this about. It's going to take Jesus coming. Things are Things are getting really bad, right? Yeah. So that brings us kind of back up to William Miller. But if we want to go forward from there, right, where we left off with um, with the Branch Davidians and David Koresh and Waco, the other thing we have to deal with is Christian Zionism, right? There's this idea of Zionism, which is the Jewish idea of Jews returning to Palestine, right, to the, the Holy Land, the uh, land of uh, the land of Israel, the promised land, right? This has its roots, I mentioned already, in, in the 17th century. It actually has roots in Calvinism, right? Because there's this idea of the elect. Mm -hmm. So then you have this London Society for Promoting Christianity Among Jews, uh, which Lord Ashley takes over in 1848. And then he meets William Heschler. Heschler is connected with this, uh, the founder of Zionism, which is, uh, who is Theodor Herzl. And Theodor Herzl starts this movement of modern Zionism when he publishes The Jewish State. And he makes an argument for a modern secular nation state of Israel in 1896. Heschler is one of the three Christian attendees of the first Zionist conference, which is in 1897. By 1917, we get the British government and the Balfour Declaration giving it, this is the first, you know, nation state. Uh, that's recognizing this idea, right? It's going to, the Brits are going to get behind the Jewish state uh, that is uh, envisioned by Theodor Herzl. And then, of course, the modern nation state, the modern secular nation state of Israel is founded in 1948 or established in 1948. So where we are now is in a recent poll, according to Ehrman, a recent poll by Lifeway Research says that some 80% of evangelicals, evangelical Christians believe that the establishment of the state of Israel was a fulfillment of biblical prophecy and that that shows that we're now closer to the second coming of Christ. You know, one of the really interesting things about this fact here, Christopher, that, that came out as I was reading Ehrman's book and, and doing some other research on this, and it fit in with our study of the Jewish Bible and as we've been going through the New Testament as well. The idea here is sort of this underlying motivation that uh, Christians have uh, 
for supporting Zionism, right? What is it? Why is it, you know, you go back and, and, and try to understand why is it that Christians feel that it is so important for Jews to return to Palestine and to establish a state and what it comes down to, uh, come to find out, is the idea that the Jews need to rebuild their temple. Now, this all comes out of an understanding of some passages within Ezekiel and the book of Daniel, and then also how Second Thessalonians is understood. And these all sort of tie together in the sense that they that Second Thessalonians is alluding to what we find in some passages in Ezekiel and Daniel. The idea is that once the temple is rebuilt, it will then allow the event to occur, which is called in Daniel the abomination of desolation. At least that's the King James translation of it. Or in the NRSV, we get the abomination that makes desolate. This is understood to be, within the book of Daniel, this is understood to have been the king Antiochus IV having set up a statue of Zeus in the temple. In other words, the idea is that the temple is desecrated, right? And so this happens um, during the time of Antiochus IV. It's in the 160 BC, around in there. Then we get the Maccabean revolt, right? All that. Fast forward a little bit to the time after Jesus, and we're going to have this happen again in a way by the Romans. The Romans are going to come in to Jerusalem, and they're going to burn the temple to the ground, right? Tear it to the ground. And this is seen as a a desecration of the site. So this is seen as maybe a second instantiation or a second fulfillment of this prophecy, right? And so when we get in the New Testament scripture, Second Thessalonians, that says this is supposed to happen again, right? Christians aren't just looking at, at 70 AD and saying, oh, there it happened. It already happened. Again, this becomes projected into the future. This is something that is going to happen still in the future. So if the temple has to be destroyed still in the future and it's not there, that means the temple has to be rebuilt and someone has to go in and desecrate the temple and destroy it. So all this to say that without really realizing it, it seems that the the roots of the Christian support and motivation for Zionism, that is the return of the Jews to the land and the establishment of some sort of state that can then organize to build a temple, is that the Christians believe that is necessary to fulfill the prophecy that the temple will be destroyed or desecrated again, which will then trigger a war. And so I, I think what you're saying, Ben, is, and I'm just going to put it bluntly, what we're really dealing with is Christians believe that the Jews need to return to Jerusalem so they can build the temple so Jesus can come and send them all to hell. Something like that. Something like that. Right. And and I don't know that, you know, if you ask your average Christian you know, and you present that line of thinking to them, they probably will reject it. But if they understood really the underpinnings of the motivations for the support and how it's come about and and why it's become such a cultural uh, imperative for them, that's where it comes from, right? That That is where it comes from. This idea that we need to hasten the return of Jesus by fulfilling the prophecy that we need to start a war and the starting of the war has to happen by the temple being destroyed and the temple can only be destroyed if it gets built and the temple can only get built if there's an institution, a state that can build it and that state can only exist if there are enough Jewish people there to do it, right? So this all kind of happens in a chain uh, is, is, is how they see this. 
Right. And that, of course, is in the context of modern nation states, right? Correct. Uh, that's what that's what we have. And so that's why it has to be a modern nation state. So I do think in some sense, though, that modern nation state of Israel can be said to have been conflated with the ancient people of, uh, of Israel, right? This is yes, a, a very secular. Much so. it's, a, it's a modern secular nation state. And as a matter of fact, you know, the, one of the problems with rebuilding the temple is that sitting on top the the Temple Mount, uh, the site of the original temple, is the Dome of the Rock. This is uh, the 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 city of Jerusalem. Of course, is is a holy city for Jews, Christians, and Muslims. And the Dome of the Rock is a, a Muslim sacred place, right? So this is this is the place where um, Muhammad ends up when he makes his night journey from Mecca to Jerusalem, which is an Ascension text. And the Al-Aqsa Mosque is there too, that's right. And so this is called the the farthest mosque. Al-Aqsa means the farthest. And so this is problematic, right? Because this would cause a lot of trouble in the world. Now, here's the good news, Ben. Because the modern nation state of Israel is secular, I don't think that anyone who is in charge there, right? You're talking about it takes a government. The government is not going to do this. Does that make Mm -hmm. sense? Can I say that? The government's not going to do this. It's just irrational from their point of view. Maybe or maybe not. Uh, What we do see there, though, are there are groups and factions that are constantly trying to, to incite some sort of confrontation where they can then take over and make something like this happen. And what you see is not only, you know, retaliation and resistance from the the Muslim side, but you see the Israeli government actually coming in and and putting down that as well. And so I, I remember, you see this from time to time, but I remember a, an article I saw just a little while back that there was uh, someone who was trying to take an animal to sacrifice up on the Temple Mount, right? And they were stopped by the Israeli government, not allowed to do that because, of course, this would, you know, this implies all kinds of things and would set in course, uh, you know, some more violence and stuff. So uh, there's there's this balancing act that's always sort of in place in some ways. And we could we could go into a whole a whole thing on on all the complexities and intricacies and multifaceted sides and and horrors and and tragedies of this this conflict and and everything that's involved in it, I think our purpose here is to point out that the motivations behind support for certain policies that people have, they they often don't realize the implications and roots of their support. And one of the things that we want to point out here, especially in the context of the book of Revelation, is that the way that scripture is understood and read influences policy and creates a momentum that people aren't aware of necessarily where this momentum is coming from, why it is that they are supporting what they are supporting and what the implications of that are. Right. So they also don't know where it's, where it's carrying them, right? The momentum, where does it come from? Where is it going? By the way, Ben, you know, before we move on, I think I think I heard you agree with me in some sense because if somebody, yes, you know, of course, if Muslims have a sacred site there too, they're going to want to avoid anything that looks like, you know, that they're that that site is at risk or that it's going to be replaced or torn down or the temple is going to be rebuilt. And so you mentioned, you know, how they're responding, and you mentioned also that. The, the government of the modern secular nation state of Israel is actually stopping either side, right? This is what I was saying, that they, 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 they're irrational actors, right? Uh, when compared to uh, those on either side yeah. who would have something like their, at least their version of biblical prophecy being fulfilled yeah. in any way. So there is that. So I think that brings us then to now let's talk about where does this all come from, right? What is this book of Revelation? What is it? What's the historical context of this book? If it's not about the future, what is it and where does it come from? Yeah, so book of Revelation 
we have talked a little bit or we're going to talk a little bit about authorship. You know, it, it says it's written by someone named John. This John does not identify himself as the Apostle John. It has been attributed to that, but we'll we'll discuss here in a bit several reasons why it doesn't really make sense to attribute the book of Revelation to the Apostle John, the same one that the Gospel of John is attributed to. Now, the historical context here is that you've got, again, this, this new Jewish movement, which is going to be termed Christianity, that is growing as a community and seeking to identify itself and do the boundary maintenance and and so forth, right, that, that we see within all of the epistles that we just went through and read. Now, in the process of this, you are going to get a people that identifies themselves as apart from the rest of the world, right, society. And society or the world becomes equated with Roman culture. And so, the Roman polytheistic culture in in many ways gets set up uh, juxtaposed against what we might call monotheistic Christian culture. And whereas the Jewish identity had sort of found its niche and been accommodated by Rome, the Christians have trouble making that happen. And one of the main reasons, well, there, there's a couple main reasons. One is that they are rejected by the the Jewish establishment as something legitimate, right? So whereas they may see themselves as a Jewish movement, they become rejected by the Jewish establishment as a Jewish movement. And that, in many ways, is largely because of their movement into an adoption of Gentiles, of Greeks, and so we saw all this in the letters of Paul, right? I mean, this this comes out in in what is going on. How is this church able to form an, an identity or these churches, right? Because we see that it's not just one, that there's different traditions and different ideas about how it's all supposed to work and who is in and who's out. And as Christianity is working this all out, the Romans are are kind of trying to figure out how to deal with this as well because... The Christians don't know in some ways whether they are how how what their relationship to Rome is, right? Are they supposed to go along with the polytheistic culture? Are they supposed to reject it? And the mainstream Christianity uh, comes to reject that polytheistic culture for various reasons. And so then we start having persecution. And sometimes the persecution is institutionalized and sometimes it's not. What I mean by institutionalized, sometimes it's sanctioned by Roman government, by the Roman emperor, and other times it's not. It's just something done on a more local level to persecute Christians for not uh, going along with the cultural uh, sacrifices and, and uh, either the the cult of the emperor or the general sacrifices to the, the different deities. And so over time, there develops this narrative that the Christians are are persecuted and Within this this persecution narrative, the Christians start seeing themselves as a distinct oppressed group. And so this is sort of the milieu in which the author of this, of the book of Revelation, is entering the stage, right? And writing Revelation pulls from and is influenced by a genre, and that genre is the apocalyptic genre. And it's used for various reasons by this author, but uh, as we go into the how the genre works, it will make a little more sense why it is that it was used and what the message is that it's trying to convey about this community and to the community and, and their identity in the world. Uh, genre, as we've pointed out on this podcast over and over again, is important to reading something, right? If you don't know the genre, it's easy to misread. And if you know the genre, it's easier to read, right? Because genre, ha genre has conventions, right? So if I know this is this genre, I know, I know to expect it to be such and so. And if I know it's that genre, I know it to be otherwise, right? And so the same, sometimes you can, you can imagine the same thing being said, meaning the words are the same, 
in in different genres and that makes all the difference right which genre it is tells you how to read those words right is it a joke is it satire is it serious is it uh, a polemic right it, it just depends on the genre and so we have to understand the genre of apocalypse to understand the book of revelation because it fits in that genre Absolutely. And I know that in Ehrman's book, he gives some some good examples of this. You know, the one that came to mind for me is is kind of what you mentioned, Christopher, is that if you you can read the same words and if, say, it's comedy, say it's a comedy routine that somebody is giving. Well, you know, who is this person? What's their name? What's their culture? What's their background? What's their race? What's their audience, right? All of this can inform an understanding of what it is that they're saying and how they're saying it. And you could take the same words that they're saying in that context, move them into a different genre of prose or publish in a book. And all of a sudden it either makes no sense or it's wildly inappropriate, right? Something like that. And so misunderstood, misunderstood. And so a a huge part of understanding or approaching an understanding of the book of revelation is understanding what the genre is. And that is squarely apocalyptic. Now, we mentioned another book of scripture that is also apocalyptic and from which the book of Revelation draws heavily, and that's the book of Daniel. Specifically, we're talking about sort of the later chapters of Daniel, because the beginning of Daniel sort of is a recount of some different stories that come out of the Babylonian exile. And then the later chapters of Daniel are more specifically what we might call the apocalypse of Daniel. And these go into this this revelation and talking about uh, what is going to happen, right? Now, if we, if we look in the canon, in the Old Testament canon, we can see what we might consider some proto-apocalyptic uh, pieces. We find these in Isaiah and Jeremiah. Um, Ezekiel might be one of, if not uh, the earliest example of some solid apocalyptic literature. Joel has some apocalyptic parts to it. Zechariah does. So what is an apocalypse? Uh, how do we define that? Yeah, so you could do it different ways. I'm going to read a definition that I found here that I think is is useful. So an apocalypse is generally defined as, quote, a genre of revelatory literature with a narrative framework in which a revelation is mediated by an otherworldly being to a human recipient, disclosing a transcendent reality, which is both temporal insofar as it envisages eschatological salvation and spatial insofar as it involves another supernatural world. And whose definition is that? That comes largely from uh, Jared Halverson. He wrote a little bit on this and and gave this this definition. And I'm going to go over some of the words in this, but you know, we, we've used the word eschatological a lot. And eschatology just has to do with a discussion of the end times, right? What's happening at the end of the world. And it, when we look at the the book of Revelation, it does follow this, this framework here, right? So we've got a narrative, sort of a story that's developing. It's mediated by this otherworldly being. It's largely an angel for, for a lot of it. It's maybe Christ himself in some of the book. It's showing this again, this transcendent reality, as it says, right? He's seeing all of these symbolic things. At some point, he doesn't understand what he's seeing, right? And this sort of is is denoting the fact that the things of God are, are above the understanding of man. They, they take explanation. So then the angel has to explain this to him. They talk about salvation. We're seeing things that are happening both in, in different areas, but also of the world itself, temporally, but also talking about something that is of another world, maybe afterlife or or something that is in a higher plane, right? All these things pertain to what we find in the book of Revelation. And these these all sort of denote it as an apocalyptic genre. And so taking this, we actually see uh, the apocalyptic literature is vast, both within our canon and in non-canonical or apocryphal works. And so in Isaiah, we see 
some uh, what we might call proto-apocalyptic passages. Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Joel and Zechariah all have apocalyptic parts to them. Now, we may have mentioned already the book of Daniel, specifically, you know, the latter chapters of Daniel um, are apocalyptic and are even called the apocalypse of Daniel. So I'm going to throw out here just for the sake of demonstrating that apocalypse is a genre, meaning there are lots of pieces of literature that fit within this genre. And the more of them that you're familiar with and read, the more you realize that they have similar characteristics. And so we have some non-canonical works or apocryphal works that that fit within this genre. There's Third Enoch. There's an apocalypse of Abraham. There's an apocalypse of Adam that are considered part of this genre. When we move into, those are sort of like Old Testament time uh, apocalypse that are dealing with uh, with matters of pre-Christian times. But even in the New Testament, within our canon, there's some apocalyptic stuff happening within the 24th chapter of Matthew. Mark 13 has some. We've already talked about 2 Thessalonians. We see pieces of uh, apocalyptic genre within the letters of Timothy and 2 Peter and Jude. Obviously, we're talking about Revelation as this. But then we've got apocryphal or non-canonical works that are part of the Christian tradition, but they're not in the canon. We have something called the Apocalypse of Peter, the Apocalypse of Thomas, and then there's even a whole group of Gnostic apocalypses, right? I mention all of these not to say, hey, everybody has to go read all this stuff, but again, to say this is a genre. There are lots of works that are part of it, and when you start seeing the patterns that are presented in these genres, you start realizing that revelation is part of a tradition so that you see why things are presented the way they are in the book. And again, it's very much a a Jewish uh, genre, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it finds its, uh, its roots within the Jewish tradition. And so all of these things are going to be coming out and and referencing most heavily revelation references the book of daniel for its symbolism and and rhetoric right ben do you know the timing of apocalyptic literature because it's sort of it doesn't show up until when it's from when to when so one of the features also of apocalyptic literature is that they will often if not always purport to be about some future event. But scholars can tell when you go and you look at the the actual literature that it was written after that event. Uh, We saw this, uh, especially when we looked at the book of Daniel, and we covered this in our episode on the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, where some of the events were so detailed in the way that they were uh, set out in the book that scholars are able to date the book of Daniel more specifically or more precisely than almost any other book that we have in the Bible because they see the events right up to a certain date and then the events after that date didn't happen the way that the book of Daniel says that they did and the ones before it did happen exactly like it said. And so this happens a lot with apocalyptic literature. It will give very specific details about some certain events and then it'll get to a point where it gets a little more vague and, and doesn't quite match what you may see. And that's because that piece of literature was written at a certain time as if it were talking about the future, even though the events it's recounting has, have already happened, right? And so we see that some with the book of Revelation as well. Yeah, so that's typical of, of Apocalypse, right? Is that it is. it's going to be written later than it purports to be so that it can accurately predict quote unquote future events that have already passed and then once we get to the time when it's actually written it continues to predict it's now it's gotten our trust ironically through through deception right and now it's going to predict what's coming next but then things become less specific they have to be more highly symbolic and less specific right because well, that these things haven't happened yet, right? And it's suggesting that they're going to happen. And so they have to be they have to be spelled out in some way that's not really spelled out the way the things that already have happened have been. So I'm gonna go back to one of the things I was talking about with historical context. And it was, you know, when was this book of Revelation written? And it was at the cusp of when this 
community, this Christian community, is facing persecution and trying to place itself within the broader world and and ask itself the question of, you know, what is our history? How do we how do we push forward our identity and, and where are we going to be in the world in the future, right? And so this is sort of speaks to the question of why why is apocalyptic literature written and, and when can we expect to see it within a historical development of of literature writing, right? It, within different traditions. And that is that uh, scholars have identified you, you most often see apocalyptic literature pop up within a community when that community starts feeling threatened, right? When there's a time of crisis that has come about and the community is trying to forge its way f- forward, what's its identity supposed to be in the future? How is it going to survive this crisis? And so this apocalypse comes about as a way of of sort of uh, opening that or, or presenting hope to a people that is persecuted that they they will overcome this persecution. They will prevail in the end. And that's what we see in the book of Revelation. Yeah. And that's important, Ben, because what it's doing is it's telling you, listen, I know things are really bad right now, but don't worry. This situation that you're dealing with is going to be reversed. They're going to mm-hmm. get theirs. They're, you know, they've got, they're, they're on top now, but you're going to be on top then, right? That's where this is going. And so when this literature shows up is somewhere between 200 BC and 200 AD. And so that means, again, reminding ourselves that the book of Daniel is not as old as maybe you might have thought it was. Yeah, this is a time of of crisis and identity forging for Jews, especially we talked about this as a, a Jewish genre in particular, because this is a time when they are questioning, you know, hey, we've returned, we build our temple, but why are we not uh, a free people yet? Why are we not an independent people yet? And so they go through all these iterations of of messiahs, and this is, you know, Jesus is enters into this milieu as well. And so it makes sense that there's a lot of these apocalyptic genres at this time, because they're trying to figure out how as a people they're going to survive this crisis and overcome. Exactly. And this is really important because, you know, the it reminds us, as you say, after they return, right? This is returning from exile. This is when the Tanakh, right, is being put together. This is when the Jewish canon is coming together. And it's, again, between 200 BC and 200 AD. So we're already, some of this is happening in the Christian era, right? So we're having even the the selection of the canon itself, given that part of Judaism is this sect that we now call Christianity, right? That has identified Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah. That actually plays into the process of canonization of the Tanakh, right? Of the what we call the Old Testament, because there were views that that had you know the the suffering servant and the Messiah be the same person. But once Christians said the suffering the suffering servant and the Messiah were the same person, and that person was Jesus, that view fell out of favor, and so. Both the Christians and the Jews, as you've pointed out, Ben, are trying to figure out what's going on because things aren't going well for them and and they're supposed to be, right? So that means that they're going to in the future, right? Right. But we're not talking about thousands of years in the future. We're talking about, again, sometime soon. As a matter of fact, we're right there, right? Usually this is, we're on the cusp, right? Things are so bad right now we're getting there. This is, this is, we're close to the end, right? Jesus is saying we're close to the end. The author of Revelation is saying we're close to the end. Paul was saying we're close to the end, right? They're all expecting this within their own lifetime. And that's why we can see here clearly identified, as I mentioned in my, in my history of the interpretation of this text that I gave, you're going to, you come to a point where one of the interpreters realizes this is about Rome. This is about Nero. This isn't in some kind of chronological order either. This is a jumble, right? That's sort of going over and over again, the same events and kind of looking at them in a different light and making emphasis on on some on certain things, right? Certain aspects. We'll go into the themes and the symbols a little bit too. Yeah, absolutely. One thing I want to mention again on the topic of genres is that the listener may, if, if they are familiar with Latter-day Saint canon, 
right, they may have noticed that a lot of the features and characteristics that we mentioned about the apocalyptic genre can be found within Latter-day Saint, uniquely Latter-day Saint canon. So within the Book of Mormon in particular, we have uh, the vision of Nephi, which can be termed an apocalypse. It, it meets a lot of the criteria of this, right? And this might be roughly... First Nephi chapters 11 through 14. Uh, very interesting, especially in relation to the book of Revelation. And there's a lot that we could go into and comment on that um, and, and compare between the book of Revelation and, and Nephi's vision. But we also have some apocalyptic things happening in the Doctrine and Covenants. There's various sections that are apocalyptic in nature. And then we get the book of Moses in the Prolog Great Price, which has sort of a, a Latter-day Saint version of the book of Enoch. And this is an apocalypse of Enoch because he's seeing uh, all the history of the world and what's going to happen and who's going to triumph in the end, right? So within the Latter-day Saint canon, we can see uh, different apocalypses that uh, fit within the genre. Yes, absolutely. And that's, you know, when, when it comes to, you mentioned Nephi's vision, it's both Lehi's dream and Nephi's vision, right? You could see either or or both, maybe even together. You know, Halverson argued that it's together. It could be expanded to include that. Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, He argued that together they form an apocalypse. No, going back a little bit to the authorship, I did mention that the author identifies himself as John. Now, there isn't anywhere in the text that this John says he is an apostle or that he is John the Beloved, right? And I don't know that it is even meant to imply that. Um, several things going on here not the least of which is if we compare the themes and the tone and the rhetoric of this book to the gospel of John, there really are extremely few similarities. And if we go further and we look at the actual Greek of the text, the Greek of the book of Revelation is either intentionally bad for rhetorical purposes or is written by somebody who just basically barely knows Greek, right? And so whoever wrote the Gospel of John definitely knew Greek a lot better than the person who wrote the book of Revelation. If I'm not mistaken, this is the worst Greek in the it's entire terrible. New Testament. Yeah, it's terrible. And one of the theories, which I will say is not very popular among scholars, but I thought it was interesting to mention, is one of the theories is that it's possible that it was intentionally written bad for rhetorical reasons, kind of like a street Greek, if you will, right? But the problem is hmm. that we don't see this form of Greek in really any other ancient literature. So we don't have any way of comparing it to some other text, right? And saying, oh, look, you know, it, it's the same form of Greek, right? It's just bad Greek. The grammar's bad. Yeah. And interestingly, that brings us back to John, right? Because if if you yeah. did find something comparable, then that puts it in, a, in some sense in a different genre, right? Sure. And that's not yeah. what's happening. Now, the book of Revelation would have most likely been written during the reign of the emperor Domitian, which would have been sometime between 81 and 96 CE. So this is probably after the destruction of the temple. It's possible there are parts of it that were written before that time, but most likely the, the final composition is happening before 100 CE. I have a couple of comments about that, Ben, because first I said earlier, right, that this is about Rome. It's about Nero. Now you're saying yeah. Domitian. So Nero ruled from 54 to 68, so earlier. But that's to my point, right? If this is being written in the time of Domitian and it's pretending to have been written earlier, then it's going to predict what happens during the reign of Nero when, in fact, the author already knows what happened, right? It already happened right. during the reign of Nero. Now, by the way, neither one of these emperors that we know, there's no more persecution, no more or less persecution during the reigns of Nero or Domitian than any other time. But you've already talked about that, Ben, right? There's, yeah. It's not really about history necessarily. It's about the story that we tell ourselves, right? The story that these Christians were telling themselves about what's happening to them and how they're feeling, right? It's about how they feel. And there are persecutions. This is not to say that there aren't persecutions. The question is, is it particularly bad under Nero? And I don't think it is, or Domitian for that matter. But this is dealing with Nero's time, and there is persecution. I'm not saying there's not. 
But yeah, if it's written during Domitian's time, then it's pretending that it's written earlier and predicting the persecutions of uh, the time of Nero. And so we get those symbols uh, referring to Nero that I, I guess we'll go into later, right? Yes. Now, as far as the canonical status of the book of Revelation, you know, it was pretty controversial in the early centuries. It was not really considered authoritative or canonical. Uh, you mentioned some reasons for that. A lot of Christians thought that it was too materialistic in its views, you know, that the the Christians who finally triumphed would be rewarded with riches and wealth and mansions and, you know, and power and authority was by many early Christians didn't didn't fit with the message of Jesus, right? But, you know, over time, it started gaining traction. It was considered canonical by, say, the third or fourth century by some commentators, but it still was considered less authoritative in some ways, even all the way up to Luther, um, who kind of put it in an appendix along with some of the other books, right? Luther didn't really care much for the book of Revelation as far as uh, what he considered authoritative scripture. And so we have these different views uh, over the centuries of, of what it is and, and what it means. And uh, we come to a, a modern time where it's been canonized for so long that as you went through, Christopher, the, the history of the interpretation, you know, the book of Revelation for the past, I don't know, 150 years or so has entered a place where for many Christians, it should be interpreted literally, right, in a fundamentalist literal type of way. And so it wasn't always viewed this way. In fact, some of these these early commentators said, well, it's, it's only canonical if it's interpreted symbolically, right, or, or anagogically, but not literally. That's right. We have, of course, the, you know, the, the spiritual symbolic interpretation vis-a-vis -vis the material historical interpretation. So let's talk about some of the themes, you know, so some of the themes that we see in this text, you know, well, first, I want to mention again that I see it really referring back not only to earlier apocalypses like those of Daniel and Ezekiel, right? I see references to Exodus and to Genesis and, and even even earlier than Genesis, right? The The myths that the authors of Genesis drew from, from Mesopotamia, right? With, when it comes to the sea monster, right, this kind of thing. You can see why, I guess there are multiple reasons why it would be placed in the canon last, right? If you're, if you're not thinking of the Bible as this collection of disparate texts that it is, right, and you're putting them together and you want to say, this is a story of all of, you know, history, right? This is sacred history. This is the history of humanity. This is the history of God's dealings with men. Then, of course, it starts from the creation and it ends with the eschaton, uh, which we said is the end, right? The end of the world. And so it has these, these themes, just like we saw in the Exodus, the crossing of the Red Sea. We're going to see here now that the Euphrates is going to dry up. So now the kingdoms from the east can now cross over the Euphrates and invade, uh, things like this, right? What else do you see, Ben? Yeah, at the end of the book, there's a, a return to Eden, right? Because there's the tree of life and there's the river flowing, right? So we do get both the Exodus. We also get back to Genesis. You mentioned that there's the theme of the sea monster, that the dragon, right, that's coming out of the sea or the beast that comes out of the sea. This does sort of return us to some of those Mesopotamian or Canaanite uh, myths and we even see the sea dry up, right? So this is not just a defeating of the dragon, but a defeating of chaos itself as symbolized by the sea. And, you know, we talked about how in these apocalypses, there are often, you know, themes, uh, recurring themes. There, there might be dichotomies and that are hyperbolic. And we definitely see that here within Revelation. We see a lot of things going on that we might tie into a tradition of purity, right? So the author here of Revelation is concerned with the, the purity and identity of the people. And so we get statements about uh, not just sexual morality in a literal, but maybe just symbolic sense, but we also get some condemnations of eating meat sacrificed to idols, right? Which, which Paul 
didn't think that was a huge deal, but this author is very much opposed to, right? This is, this is a big no, no. This is something really important uh, about this text, Ben, that, that I saw that, that I think it's easy to miss if your focus is on the end of the world and you're not putting this in its context, right? So what I see in its context is it, following along with the book of Hebrews, right? With this idea of the, the heavenly temple, right? That you're going to have this, this purity culture that's very much like the Deuteronomists uh, are giving us earlier, you know, in the Old Testament and the Hebrew Bible, that you're going to have, um, by the way, the trumpets, right, that show up. They, to me, you know, before I studied this at this level, right, as, as a, you know, an average Christian, I thought this was something special about the end of the world, but it's, this is part of temp- the temple, right? The same with the bowls. The bowls of uh, that are that are poured out on the earth, right? Those are having to do with the the collect the incense in the temple, right? Yeah. And I'll tell you something else, Ben. Something else that doesn't fit Jesus's teachings, right? All the violence, but it does. Again, go back to those myths, right? That that come into Genesis. Where's Leviathan in the Old Testament? You get the Leviathan too, right? We do see that in Job once, yeah. Leviathan. In Job, yeah. So we have these this sea monster that is a representation of chaos. Uh, we're talking about order and chaos, right? That's part of this. Another principal theme that we see in the book is that of dominance. So whereas at the beginning or, or as things are happening, you have the beast or you have the the whore who dominates the world, right? This is the condition where the the community, the Christians are persecuted and the dominance is, is of the adversary, the beast or the dragon or, or the whore, right? And right. this becomes flipped, right? And so at the end of the book, the dominance is switched over to God's side or God's people side, and they rule by an iron rod, right? So it's not just that the enemies are pacified, it's that the righteous then take over and they're the ones in power now, right? And they're the ones that are, are able to vanquish and and either uh, commit violence against or destroy the wicked, right? Those who have persecuted them. And so there's a lot of vengeance going on here. As you mentioned, a lot of violence happening in this. There are uh, as I mentioned, these hyperbolic dichotomies that happen, everybody is either with us or against us, right? As we talked about the genre, this comes up in Nephi. I remember, you know, it, there's a point in, in Nephi's vision where it says there are saved two churches only, right? The church of the devil and the church of God, right? <laughs> and so this kind of dichotomy that, that develops within the genre happens here in the book of Revelation as well. And now that you mentioned the horror, you know, going back to the purity theme, the temple theme, you know, again, like the Deuteronomist, the horror is not, and the sexual purity is not necessarily about sexuality, right? The, the, because this is very much associated in the the mind of these authors, right? Whether it's the, the Deuteronomist earlier or now the author of this apocalypse, which again, seems very Jewish in this way, right? This is very much about the temple and it's about uh, ritual purity. And so fornication and whoredom, it becomes associated with idolatry. In fact, whoredom can right. actually mean whoring after other gods, right? It's not even about sexuality. It's about infidelity to God in worshiping other gods. Yeah, that becomes its most common symbolic usage within the Old Testament. And so it makes very much a lot of sense that that symbolism persists here, especially as we're talking about the book of Revelation as a very, very Jewish text, maybe more Jewish in, in a certain sense than all the other New Testament texts. Yes, indeed. Okay, so in, in thinking about symbols now, why don't we go into the summary of the text, Ben, and we can pull those symbols out of it and give you, we're not really going to go through the text other than to give the summary and to interpret some of the symbols and have, and make some comments on, on it, on the text by going through the summary. Sounds good. 
Okay, so I'm borrowing from Ehrman's book again, Armageddon, and I'm actually going to, in, in his summary, it's very useful, and, and what I've tried to do is to, to summarize that more, and that's with the help of a, a volunteer. You know, Latter-day Peace Studies is an all-volunteer effort. You and I are volunteering. Lena, who put together this summary of, of Ehrman's summary, is volunteering. So thanks to uh, thanks to you, Ben, and to her, and to and to Ehrman. So we have the beginning of the end, as Ehrman calls it, in chapter one, right? So here, God has sent this revelation to his slave John. We already mentioned the really bad grammar and writing, uh, worst of the whole Bible, and he wants to show his slaves the things that must happen soon. So this is a revealing, right? It's an unveiling or an apocalypse. That's what apocalypse means. That's the Greek for unveiling. It has highly symbolized visions as a genre, and it shows that God is sovereign and he's going to triumph in the end. And this is one of the themes that we've already brought out. So the revelation does not come directly from God, we're told. God gave it to Christ, who then sends his angel to his slave, John, and then he's going to pass it on to his followers, the seven churches of Asia. Now there's this vision of Christ. He shows up with his hair white as wool, eyes like flames, feet like fine bronze, voice like rushing river, seven stars in his hands, and a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, his face shining like the sun. You know, one thing I want to mention here, Christopher, and you know, this might go without saying, but this number seven, right? This is a symbolic number of completion, and it's going to show up all over the place in the book of Revelation. And this description of the vision of Christ, right, that are talking about things like, it says like flames, like bronze, like rushing water, right? And then it says he has seven stars in his hand, but it doesn't use the word like anymore. And it says he has a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, but it doesn't say like anymore, right? And so we have these similes, but then we have these statements of, of fact, right, that aren't similes. And the question comes up for me, like, okay, so do people that want to take the book of Revelation literally, like in a fundamentalist way, right, is this an actual sword that's coming out of Jesus' mouth? Does he actually have seven stars in his hands? Or are these symbols, right? And and the question always comes up, okay, which things are symbolic and which aren't? And I think from a literalist point of view, where you draw the line is largely arbitrary, right? It has to be. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Now, I wanted to mention the two-edged sword, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. whether it's, I'm not dealing with whether it's literal or not, I, I think it's a symbol. It's clearly a symbol. You know, this is a symbol of the archetypal king, right? The sword. And it has two edges because it's a symbol of discernment, right? The king is one who discerns. The greatest example I can think of is Solomon, who's, who wants to take the 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 figurative sword this this archetypal symbol and use it to literally cut a baby in half he says right because the two women are arguing that that the baby is uh, each of them says the baby is hers and he says well let's cut the baby in half and give half to each woman and that's how he finds out that's how he discerns right the the sword cuts in discernment between truth and between error yeah and i should mention here that you know, the sword is coming out of his mouth. It's not in his hand. And notwithstanding all of the violence that we see in this book, and even later in the later chapters, the sword that's coming out of his mouth does go and slay people, right? There is symbolism to it coming out of his mouth and not being in his hand. And this is because it's the word. It's the words he speaks, right? It's the word of God that's the two-edged sword. Doctrine and Covenants picks up on this a lot. And, and so this is the way that Joseph Smith saw this symbolism, right? Is that this is the word of God. This isn't some literal sword that's actually killing people, whether, whether John meant it that way or not. I think one of the good points that Ehrman makes about this is that we see a lot of violence right here in the book of Revelation. And it is pretty obvious that the author here, John, means this as symbolic. And yet he's still using this symbolism right, in a very powerful way to present this violence. And you, Christopher, have, have brought up some good points about this, is that, you know, if if we don't mean violence, why do we still use it as a symbol, right, uh, to 
to convey something serious to people? Couldn't we have done that in in a less violent way? And I think that's a good question for us to ask ourselves as we, we read this. It is, yeah. So now John is told to write what he has seen, things that are and things that are shortly to take place. The letters of the seven church now show up in chapters two and three. The churches need to conquer things that are defeating them in their faith. They have three problems. Number one, persecution. Uh, Jews are specified, not Romans. That's interesting. Number two, false teachings that come from leaders of the, in the church. That's also interesting. They come from leaders in the church. And number three, followers lacking in fervor. So John reports that he's taking now dictation from Christ himself. Yeah, that's kind of strange to me. Uh, you know, I think uh, one of the notes that Lena made here was, hey, I thought this was coming through an angel. And then all of a sudden it's it's Christ. And so there does seem to be a little bit of back and forth here. Sometimes the vision is an angel. Sometimes it's Christ giving it and, and it's a little back and forth. Yeah. John is unhappy with his followers. He's extremely unhappy with the whole human race. The seven letters now all are going to follow the same basic sequence. First, Christ identifies himself by one of the images used elsewhere in the book, saying, for example, that he's the one who holds the seven stars and walks among the seven lampstands, or that he's the first and the last who came back to life from the dead. Then he's going to assess the church's individual situation, good, bad. In most cases, he focuses on the bad. He then threatens the church community that he'll respond harshly if they don't change their ways. And then he extends a promise to those who return to his good graces. In Revelation, John is far more emphatic that eating meat offered to idols is an affront to Christ. And this is something you've already mentioned, Ben. So in short, you know, these chapters two and three, they set the context for the entire rest of this apocalypse, right? Christ is in charge. He considers Jews to be Satan-worshipping enemies of his people. I think, you know, some kind of polemic against Jews, I think we can say is one thing that this does have in common with the Gospel of John. But again, that's a very small uh, similarity, right? There is a little bit of a dissonance on that, I think, though, because he also talks about so-called Jews, right? He says that there are fake Jews, people that purport That's to be right. Jews who are not. And so in one sense, he's calling Jews the, the chosen pure people. And in, in another sense, he's he's saying that, that they are following after Satan. So uh, there's a little bit of, of uh, disjointedness there. And by he, do you mean the author of Revelation or the Gospel of John? The author. Yeah, yeah. The Okay. So Christians must avoid pagan associations, right? Those who are lax in their faith are in danger of losing their salvation. Christ hates Christians who do not adhere to correct teachings about how to live, so much so that he threatens them with a judgment that will be without mercy. But those who are obedient, faithful, and passionate about their faith, who in the end conquer, will be gloriously rewarded. Now we come to chapters 4 through 5. Armin calls it the throne room of God and God and the Lamb. So John is again in the spirit, quote unquote, and he arrives in heaven to a gloriously terrifying scene of four fantastic beasts or animals and 24 elders surrounding the throne of God. Now, these 24 elders are something new. Do you have anything to say about that, Ben? Yeah, so these 24 elders, I mean, I've, I've seen a couple of different views on this, right? That The scholars generally are going to say that most likely – these represent the 12 patriarchs, which are, you know, the 12 sons of Israel, right? The different tribes. And then the 12 apostles, right? So you get 12 plus 12, that's 24. Um, Joseph Smith kind of pulled back from that a little bit. He just says that these were faithful elders, right? That belonged to the seven churches. So there were seven churches and there were 24 elders who were faithful and they entered heaven, so to speak. They they are seen in the vision as surrounding the throne of God. Okay, and then the animals are supposed to reveal that the entire order of living existence has been created to bow in eternal adoration before the Creator. So then the Lamb takes the scroll from the hand of God, and all the creatures and elders around the throne worship Him, much as they worship God forever and ever. The Lamb is worthy to break the seals of the mysterious scroll, and He begins to do so. Now, it's interesting because... One of the things, you know, I just mentioned the lamb as an example. Oftentimes, 
what we do because I think because we have to, I don't know, do we have to? We, we read things like the lamb and we decide that the lamb is Christ, right? But it doesn't say yeah, that. It's Jesus. The text doesn't yeah. sell that, right? It, or that it's Jesus, right? Christ is Jesus. Jesus is the lamb, right? That's, that's an interpretation. But what we want to say is that the text says that and the text doesn't say that. We, we, sure. we could even say the text doesn't say anything. It has to be interpreted, right? So this idea of somebody being worthy to break the seals is pretty typical in an, in an apocalypse, and it's usually uh, the prophet, right? It's, it's saying the prophet is saying he's not worthy to do this, right? Yeah, that actually comes up in, in Isaiah, right? So there's some proto-apocalyptic things happening in the book of Isaiah, and he says he's not worthy, right, to do a certain thing. And so that comes up. Now, on this topic of the lamb, a couple of things to say. The first is that, you know, one of the reasons that uh, this gets attributed to John the Beloved, right, the the same author that the Gospel of John is is attributed to, is this use of the lamb, right? Because in the Gospel of John, that term is used more. And the other thing to, to note here is that uh, when you talked about the Branch Davidians and David Koresh, right, his interpretation was that this wasn't Jesus, right? The lamb was actually him, was David Koresh, and he was the one that was worthy to break the seals. And so, again, this has been interpreted differently, you know, by different communities and, and people. And when we read it, we often just take it for granted. Oh, it it, it means Jesus, right? And uh, to us, that's what it means. It may not have even meant that to the author. That's right. And what David Koresh was doing uh, with his community, his followers, is interpreting this text, right? As Because he yeah. was the lamb. So this scroll appears to have God's directives for the fate of the planet. And now the disasters begin. So now we have the heaven-sent disasters, as Ehrman calls them, from chapters 6 to 16. Every time the lamb breaks one of the seals, there's a new catastrophe hitting the earth. First come the famous four horsemen of the apocalypse, a white horse and wields a bow which, with which he conquers, right? That's one. Now, there is the white horse prophecy. The white horse prophecy is purported to have come from Joseph Smith. Now, the interesting thing about the white horse prophecy is that even though it has been said that, no, that's not something Joseph Smith said, the content of it remains in the Latter-day Saint consciousness, and it's sure. part of apocalyptic scenarios, right? Then you have um, the red horse causing people to slaughter one another. This is That is prompting domestic bloodshed. Then there's one on a black horse, creates, a massive food, creates massive food shortages and starvation. Finally, one appears on a pale green horse and is death itself. Now, death here is personified, right? Uh, death and Hades are both personified in the Greek fashion. Hades is following death, having the authority to destroy an entire fourth of the world's population. In today's terms, Ben, that would be two billion people. The fifth seal reveals a group of Christians who are executed, not by God, but by their earthly enemies, and they plead with God for revenge against their persecutors and are told it'll come soon. Then comes the most horrific seal of all, the sixth, when the Lamb breaks the seal, cosmic chaos erupts. There's a massive earthquake, the sun turns black, the moon turns red as blood, the stars fall from the sky, the sky vanishes, and, well, you would think the world is over now with the collapse of the universe, right? But nope, wrong. We're only in chapter six. Now, I want to back up a minute and talk about the, the moon turning red as blood as an example. I'm just talking about this as an example. So for those looking for the signs that appear in the, in the book of uh, Revelation, there are two things I want to say. I'm going to hold off on one. It's going to come up later. But for now, I'm just going to mention as an example again, the, the moon turning the blood. This is something that happens all the time. It happens over and over. It has happened again and again throughout history. And that's true of most of what are considered the signs of the times. So to think that the signs of the times are unique is to be ignorant of history. You know, Christopher, this makes me think you're talking about signs of the times and and how uh, they they just keep recurring and keep happening in history. And, and there's always signs of the times if you look for them, right? That made me think of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And at the beginning of the chapter, it says, You must understand this, that in the last days, distressing times will come. 
For people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to the parents, ungrateful, unholy. Right. And it goes on to list a bunch of these other things. That, that's Socrates' times. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, you know, the, the thought that came to me when I was reading that and we said that in, in the episode on, on Second Timothy was just like, there's never been a generation that would read this and think, oh, this isn't talking about us. It's talking about some other time. Right. They're That's always right. going to think it's talking about them. And I see that in these as well, right? Sun turns to black. Oh, yeah, there was an eclipse. And there's going right. to be one next year. Oh, moon turns to blood. Oh, yeah, the, the red moon. I, I saw that just a few months ago. Stars fall from the right. sky. Oh, yeah, there was a meteor shower, right? Like this all happens. And so if you're looking for signs of the times, you're going to see them, right? And there's different ways of taking that, but it's it's just to the point that – you know, when we want to take these and and try to pin them on some specific historical event, we're going to have a really hard time because these things happen all the time. And there's a second reason, but I, but I haven't gotten to it yet. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold that in reserve. You know, thinking of the Greeks again, like I said, that sounds like Socrates' time and, and many other times yeah. too, right? Yeah. I think I've mentioned, it may have been in that same episode where, where you're going back to, right? Second Timothy. Um, my son, I've said to my son, you know, kids these days and my son says dad socrates said that which is true right that's and by the way (laughs) the eclipse you know that's right yeah the eclipse it was an eclipse in 585 bce 28 may 585 bce that was predicted by thales of miletus that was the first time an eclipse was predicted that's what moved the greeks from mythology into philosophy right mythology Mm was We have these stories to explain things because we don't have the kind of understanding it would take to predict an eclipse. But then with Thales, he predicts it. And by the way, he was alive. Can you imagine? He was alive when that eclipse happened, the one that he predicted. I wonder what he looked like. Yeah. So we're only in chapter six, Ben. Now we have all these description of wars, natural disasters, retribution, bloodshed, death to come. Again. Signs of the times of all times, right? The narrative is not showing an actual sequence of events. This is really important, but it's repeating itself in different terms and in various ways to emphasize a point. And that is, in the end, all hell is going to break loose until God brings it all to a crashing halt and brings it to an end with the destruction of his enemies. Now, this is the second thing that I was holding back, right? If you're trying to find the signs of the times, we've already dealt with that. If you want to get them in sequence, now you're really going to have a hard time because this text isn't in a sequence. It's actually jumbled and it's repeating itself and it's just doing it for emphasis, right? That's a rhetorical effect. Now we have the sixth seal. After the sixth seal, we have a one chapter hiatus. And what happens is the followers of God are separated from the rest of humankind into two major groupings. First, the 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Clearly symbolic stuff going on here, right? And these are sealed with the seal of the living God. The second group is a countless multitude from all nations, tribes, peoples, languages. In other words, these are the non-Jews. And these are the people who are identified as having washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. When Christ breaks the seventh seal, it does not lead to catastrophe. Instead, now there's silence in heaven for half an hour. And then we're introduced to seven angels, each of whom has a trumpet. Now, I'm not endorsing the joke I'm going to tell, but there is a joke about this. And I'm trying to keep this light because we are dealing here with the end of the world, right? It is said and this is a joke, of course, that men go to heaven before women. And the way we know this is right here in Revelation. And I, I like the thing I do like about this joke, Ben, it's because there's half an hour silence in heaven, right? This means there are no women there. Ha ha ha. Right. <laughs> what I like about this joke, Ben, is that it's just like the way these things are interpreted. Right. I mean, yeah. that's a joke, but I wouldn't be surprised if there isn't someone out there for whom that's not a joke. Right, the, the, yeah. whose whose actual interpretation is, oh, this means there are no women because it's silent. But come on, I've seen this interpreted uh, multiple times. You know, you you calculate half an hour. Okay, well, if a day to God is a thousand years, then they do the calculation of what a half an hour is. 
right? Or brother. And so, yeah, and so this is often, this time period, this time span given here is often used uh, in a proportional calculation of uh, the time between the, the opening of the seventh seal and then, you know, what is to happen next. And so, again, this is how these things go, right? I've seen uh, time and time again people use these types of calculations in interpretations and they just they come down to these arbitrary decisions about what these symbols mean and they will often base their entire eschatology on these arbitrary interpretations of symbols and then these arbitrary symbols are stacked on top of each other making the Mm -hmm. whole thing even more arbitrary yeah you know i'm reminded in some sense of my experience of studying physics at byu I remember going up to my physics professor. Now, I'm already a philosopher at this point. And I go up to my physics professor. I said, it seems to me that what you've got going here is a string of suppositions. And he admitted that that was the case. Now, the difference is this string of suppositions, while not true, right? Because science doesn't prove anything, contrary to what we heard over and over recently uh, during the pandemic, but rather falsifies, right? These this string of suppositions is actually useful. We have planes that don't fall out of the sky. We have skyscrapers that don't fall over, right? We have bridges that span chasms and we can cross them uh, because while not true, they're useful. I'm not so sure about some of these interpretations of the book of <laughs> Revelation, right? Okay, so now here we are, whether it's a half hour later or whatever calculations you make out of this, Uh, The women have caught up with the men in heaven. Ha ha. And now John has structured his narrative of repetitive catastrophes by making the disasters of the seven seals conclude with disasters brought by seven angelic trumpet blasts. The trumpeting then concludes with seven disasters brought by seven bulls. Now, again, those trumpets are, are connected with the temple. So are the bulls. These are bulls of incense. Here they're called the bulls of God's wrath poured by angels onto the earth. Thus, we have three sequences. The last of the seven seals contains the seven trumpets, the last of which contains the seven bowls of wrath. Seven, of course, it's a perfect number, right? So altogether, this is 11 chapters, 6 through 16, with some interludes that describe other key events, and that includes two of particular significance. First, the appearance in chapter 13 of God's arch enemy on earth, the beast of the sea. This again alludes to the Leviathan or Tiamat, right? If you're reading Enuma Elish or Atrahasis, these, you know, Babylonian, Mesop- other Mesopotamian myths. You, you said Canaanite earlier, Ben, that's true too, right? So this horrifying sea monster comes ashore. It's empowered by Satan, takes complete control of the earth. Now, this creature is often identified by readers as the Antichrist, but there's no Antichrist in this text. The Antichrist occurs only in the letters of John in the entire New Testament. There's no other Antichrist. And the number of this beast is 666. Now, you may have heard. Do you want to go into this, Ben? I've got to give you a chance to say something. (laughs) Yeah, so I've heard some pretty fun interpretations of this number. But when you really get into it, the author John here says this requires wisdom. And that the number of the name of the beast is 666. So you get this clue here that this number has to do with the name. And so sure enough, there's a very common way of calculating these numbers or a very common way of writing uh, that happened within these these ancient cultures. Now, Greek and also uh, Hebrew, for instance, didn't have originally numbers per se. The numbers were actually letters of the alphabet, and then they would indicate that they were numbers by a mark above that letter, right? And so, for instance, if if we were to say we don't have a one, two, three, four, what we have is A, B, C, D, and we just say the number one is A with a little dot above it, and the B is two with a little dot above it, okay? So that's how it, it went. So what happens here is that if we take the name of the emperor Nero, and we calculate the numbers, it comes out to be 616. Well, wait, 
Why is it 616? Well, because it turns out that there's two different ways to spell Nero. And you can do Neron. And if you do Neron, it's 666 because it adds that extra letter to it. So it adds more to the number. Well, sure enough, in a lot of the texts, we have another version. We have 666, and then we also have 616. This helps scholars really determine with a high degree of certainty that what this author is talking about is the Emperor Nero with this number 666, because other texts have 616. So yeah, there's you skipped a step though, Ben, right? Because I did first. Did I oh, skip yeah, a we have step? to. You, you did, yeah. It, it, see, it takes wisdom, remember? <laughs> then you're lacking in wisdom because you forgot to transliterate into Hebrew, right? This is using oh, Hebrew sure. gem, gematria, That's right? That's correct. Yes, yeah, yes. So we're taking either Nero Kaiser or Neron Kaiser, which, by the way, is the, the ending. It's not about spelling the name differently. We're talking about case endings, right? If we give the, the case ending Neron instead of Nero, then we get either 616 or 666. To me, the fact that you get different manuscripts with 616 versus 666 and they both add up using gematria, you know, after transliteration to Hebrew mm -hmm. to to the same uh, name just seals the deal. I mean, when I heard about 666, yeah. I thought, okay, that's a possible interpretation. But once I saw that there are manuscripts with 616 and that either way you get Nero Caesar, I thought, well, that's really clearly what's going on here. And so Babylon in this text is Rome and the beast is Caesar. And that again is something that Victorinus pointed out circa 280 CE, right? He, he understood that Babylon was Rome, the beast was Nero, and that these events were not chronological. So now after the sea beast is another beast. This one rises up from the earth. It's elsewhere called the false prophet. Its purpose is to make the inhabitants of earth worship the first beast, persuading them by performing great miracles. You know what that reminds me of, Ben? The um, the story, uh, the Pharaoh story, right? The yeah, yeah, Moses and the magicians of Pharaoh. Sure, the priests of Pharaoh. Yeah, exactly. Those it convinces, and that's everyone but the followers of Jesus, must receive a mark on their right hand or forehead. Without this mark of the beast, no one can buy or sell anything. Well, this is again, now, now that we've identified this as, as Nero, right? We have again that his visage is on the coinage, right? And so it's only through Nero that you can uh, buy or sell anything, right? One of the other things that can be going on here is this idea of the right hand or the forehead. It, often we have this imagery, this dichotomy that's presented in this book of Revelation where you have a, a symbol that is used by the adversary or the evil people, right? That is a mirror or a copy or a counterfeit of the symbol of the righteous. And so one possibility that's going on here that the scholars have pointed out is that the reason that this mark is on the right hand or the forehead is that this is where the phylacteries would have been for the Jews when they pray, right? They'll, they'll tie the prayers around their their hand uh, or the wrist or uh, around their forehead. And so the idea here is that if the evil people are going to counterfeit this, they're going to do some sort of mark on their hand or their forehead. So that might be part of what's going on here. That makes sense. And that reminds me of the Coptic Christians of Egypt, right? Who have a cross tattooed yes. on their right wrist. That may be in response to this text too, right? Yeah, and, and then also this concept of no one buying or selling anything, yes, um, could have to do with the visage on the coin. It could also have to do with the symbolism that happens here in the book of Revelation of the whore, right? That it says that it causes the nations of the earth to, to commit fornication with her, right? And this is the all of the the commerce that's happening in and out of Rome, this city and and everything that the city does to exploit the world of its riches they all flow into rome and so a lot of this can be tied with the economic system that is happening at the time and saying they can't buy or sell anything this could be sort of a, a call out of the economic system where the christians see themselves as as being exploited as as being maybe excluded from that economic system and so that is part of their persecution part of their oppression yeah sure 
Now, the second interlude involves a series of disasters, war, and bloodshed brought not by a seal, trumpet, or bowl of wrath, but by one like a son of man, Christ, along with an accompanying angel. The imagery used to describe the onslaught is terrifying. These two heavenly reapers use sickles to harvest the earth, meaning to cut down their enemies, who are likened to grapes for the winepress of the wrath of God. After these interludes, we return to the third set of seven disasters. The seven angels each pour out a bowl of God's wrath, one after the other, thus bringing the heaven-sent pain, misery, and slaughter to an end. Well, for the time being, that is. It's quite a climax. With the six bowl of wrath, demonic forces gather the kings of the entire world together to do battle against Christ. They come to the place called Armageddon. And that's the title of uh, Ehrman's book, right? Armageddon, subtitled, What the Bible Really Says About the End. Now, this place, Armageddon, is a Hebrew word. It means the mountains of Megiddo. I've been there. Have you been there, Ben? I have not. Megiddo is uh, a tell. And from this tell, you can look out over this vast valley. I mean, this is the, the valley of Megiddo, right? It's a city in, in Israel outside. It was a city in Israel, right? Outside of which a number of significant battles were fought in that place in the Old Testament. Now we come to chapters 17 through 20, the fall of Babylon. The whore is called Babylon. So this again is Rome, the name of the city of the arch enemies. By the way, those seven churches, right? Rome is the city of seven hills. So there's there's yeah. another symbol there, right? The name of the city of the arch enemies of the people of God in the Old Testament, the city that conquered Judah in 586 BCE, destroying Jerusalem and burning the temple to the ground. So that's the original Babylon. And that's why now we're calling Rome Babylon for doing the same thing in 70 AD. The whore is also a great city. She too is portrayed as the ultimate enemy of God and his people alike only now in John's day. So whoever she is, in chapter 18, Babylon's overthrown through heavenly intervention, and that leads to mourning, uh, much mourning by the kings of the earth, as well as by rich merchants and sea traders, to your point about commerce, Ben, who have done business with the great city, right? Rome, committed fornication with the whore. See, there it is. By contrast, in chapter 19, all of heaven rejoices that the whore has been destroyed, for now the lamb and his bride will celebrate their glorious union. The bride, of course, is the church who will be clothed with the bright and pure linen. Christ appears from heaven on a white horse now with all his armies to do battle with the beast and its earthly forces in the battle of Armageddon. It's no contest. The beast and its prophet, the beast of the earth, are quickly defeated and thrown alive into a lake of burning sulfur. Now, burning sulfur doesn't sound as cool as fire and brimstone, does it? <laughs> but it turns out brimstone is just archaic for sulfur. So let's hear it for the archaisms of the King James Version. Fire and brimstone, <laughs> right? Burning sulfur. Satan's not destroyed immediately. Instead, he's seized by an angel, put in chains, and thrown into a bottomless pit for a thousand years. Does that sound familiar, Ben? Yeah, bottomless pit sounds like Tartaros to me. That's right. And what happened uh, in Tartaros? The demons were thrown in there with chains. Yeah, yeah. Then comes a scene of judgment, but not for everyone. Those who had refused the mark of the beast, that is, the followers of Jesus who had been martyred, are brought back to life. And this is important, right? Because there were the persecutions of Christians meant martyrdoms, right? And so what happens to those people? I'm reminded of First Thessalonians when the Thessalonians write to Paul and they say, Hey, you, you told us Jesus was coming again. And they understood that to be in their time. And some of our, you know, brothers and sisters have died. What happens to them, right? And so those who have been martyred are brought back, just like Paul says uh, that, that they will be brought. Those who, who have died will come with Jesus, right? They're brought back to life. They're rule on earth with Christ for a thousand years. When the thousand years are over, Satan is released from his prison and once more makes war on the saints, it's a short-lived affair. The devil's defeated, captured, thrown into a lake of fire where the beast and his prophet have already been bobbing for 10 centuries, right? Then comes the denouement of this extended period of revenge and justice, the great white throne judgment. All the dead, that's everyone who's ever lived or restored to life and made to stand before the throne of God. 
a number of books are opened. To me, what's interesting about this, Ben, is that there's not just the solitary book, the Book of Life, there are these other books. And so we talk about the Book of Life being part of the judgment, but we never talk about these other books. And, you know, I mean, they're not named, they're not specified. So how could we, right? We can talk about the Book of Life because there it is, the Book of Life. But what are these other books? I don't know. It is also interesting to note, though, that it is those things which are least obvious or or most uh, cryptic that get commented on the most, right? Right. And yet, I still don't know what these books are in anybody's interpretation. Do you? I do not. No. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm okay with that, Ben. The fact that there's <laughs> only one book of life and numerous other books, presumably of death, and so there's Ehrman's interpretation, suggests that the majority of the dead who have been raised are about to receive a very bad verdict, and they do. Everyone whose name is not in the book of life is thrown into the lake of fire with the beast, the prophet, and the devil. And that brings us to the end. The new heavens, earth, and Jerusalem, chapters 21 through 22. So the first heaven and first earth is taken away, and God brings in a new one. This new Jerusalem will be the eternal home for the people of God, corresponding though in much glorified fashion to the original Jerusalem the sight of God's king, his temple, and his people. Those who enter this new city will feel no more sorrow. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, suffering, weeping, or pain. So here's the reversal, right? Things are really bad for us when this is being written. And so we're going to pretend that we wrote it earlier, accurately predict some things, get your trust, tell you about the things that are coming in more symbolic terms right and now in the end of course what happens is they get theirs they get their comeuppance right and you're going to be on top you were on the bottom now you're going to be on the top and this is supposed to give you now some kind of um solace right hope yeah hope yeah solace the new jerusalem is a marvel to behold now it come and this is the part that the early christians really didn't like you to take literally and to long or yearn or pine for right because it's going to be this 12,000 stadia cube that's about 1500 miles long by the way wide and high so 1500 miles long wide and high its length would be from about new york city to oklahoma city just saying right (laughs) it's width from miami to toronto and its height well 1500 miles (laughs) <laughs> then in one of the many glorious perplexities, that's some serious skyscrapers right there, right? Then in one of the many glorious perplexities of the book, we're told the other nations that are on earth will walk by the light of the city. Kings of other lands will bring their resources into it, and no one who practices abominations or lying will be allowed to enter, only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. The question I have here, same as Ehrman, is, What other nations, kings, and sinners? Weren't they all just destroyed? Well, you know, I I remember Ehrman talking about that and saying that in his book. But when I go back and read through the book of Revelation, I don't see a wholesale destruction of all the other kingdoms and nations and sinners. I definitely see, you know, the, the catastrophes happen where there's like a fourth uh, you know, destroyed. And then there's the conquering that happens. But I see it as a conquering that's happening in battle, right? Where you defeat the army and then you uh, take possession of the lands and the tax farming, right? The tax collecting of the people, right? Like an empire does where it conquers peoples and it maybe defeats them in battle, but it's conquered the people. So, uh, you know, I get Ehrman's point there, but I think if I had him in a room, I'd kind of push him on it a little bit. I, I, I think that there's not necessarily an inconsistency here with with the the description. So you're saying that maybe I and even Ehrman have read something into the text that's not there while we were trying really hard not to, right? You see, this happens. <laughs> maybe, or maybe I missed something that you could point out to me. <laughs> I, I can't. Uh, maybe the listener can point it out to you. That particular mystery then continues in chapter 22. We're told that the tree of life in the middle of the street of the city will bring healing for the nations and that the slaves of God, that's the saints. Remember, John, uh, the receiver of this revelation, is a slave of God. and The other slaves are the saints. They'll worship him. 
and rule as kings forever. Now, of course, um, we could ask rule whom, who else is there, but you, we've already addressed that, right? Yeah. Then we're told that outside the city of God are the dogs, sorcerers, sexually immoral murderers, idolaters, liars, right? But how did they escape the final judgment in the lake of fire? How about that one, Ben? That's a good question. Good question. Yeah. I know how Joseph Smith might answer that. Like if we look at, you know, oh, well, it's Telestial Kingdom, right? This happens after the spirit prison and, and then they go to the Telestial Kingdom. That's where murderers and, and liars and idolaters go, right? And so that's, that's outside the city. According to the Latter-day Saint. Uh, yeah, sure. It's outside the Celestial Kingdom. Yeah. Okay. And so Ehrman says the book of Revelation is nothing if not puzzling, right? Oh, it's definitely book, puzzling. Yeah, It's definitely <laughs> puzzling. Yeah. The book ends with the prophet assuring his readers that everything he says is true and that anyone who alters anything in his book will suffer the divine catastrophes described in its pages. Now, this is fun. That's a great ending, by the way. And that reminds <laughs> me of something I don't think we brought up, which is scholars see and even I see, and I, I think you said you saw too, Ben, layers to this text, right? I saw some fragmentation, I guess you could say, Maybe more than mm -hmm. layers. Okay, fragmentation, layers, yeah, something like that. Th this text may have been, may be composed of layers, right? And so it's fun that it ends this way, right? We're, I'm not to the end of what uh, Ehrman has written about it, but this is the last, it's not the last two verses, but it's close to the end of the of the book, right, that you get that if anyone alters it, They'll suffer the divine catastrophes described in its pages. You know, you were mentioning this is fun, Christopher, because this is often interpreted as, hey, you know, this is the end of the Bible. And so you can't add to or take anything away from the Bible. And I'm going to set aside the question of the Bible for a second, because within the Latter-day Saint tradition, we have, and we've already discussed this, the, the vision of Nephi, the apocalypse of Nephi, which in some sense could be considered an addition, if not like a prequel, right, to the book of Revelation, because Nephi sees all of these things. And then he says, you know, I'm not going to write the rest, or God told me not to write the rest, because John was supposed to write the rest of this, right? And so uh, I guess you could say that this could, you know, Nephi could be considered a, a, an addition to this, except that, uh, you know, John was responsible for just writing this part, right? And Nephi was responsible for writing the other part, right? So their their duties are divided up. As as you pointed out, this is what what Nephi is saying is supposed to be a prequel in some sense. So it 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 gets weird. How about that? Puzzling? How about puzzling? It does. It's puzzling. You know, back to the point about how this is interpreted uh, in some traditions to be sort of a, a signing off on the Bible, the word of God, as if these verses are talking about the entire Bible and not this specific book, the book of Revelation, right? Because, okay, a couple things. First off, the Bible is a library, not a book, as we've said, right? It, it's been compiled into a single volume, but it's a library of different texts, different books. Second, what we call the book of Revelation wasn't, you know, we look at the author at the beginning and he's not writing it as a book. He's writing it as a letter. So now all of a sudden it gets called a book at the end. It's kind of a strange thing uh, to suddenly call it a book and uh, to then ascribe these curses to anyone who changes or, or adds to it. This is actually a, a formula that we see in other ancient writings. And uh, this is sort of a, a letter or a footnote to scribes when they're supposed to copy this text, that they better not make any mistakes or alterations to it, right? They better get this word for word the exact way that it is, is written. And that's exactly where Ehrman goes with this next. And he says, for anyone who does make alterations or mistakes, it's the burning sulfur. Yeah. John certainly believes, Ehrman continues, that what he's described in this mysterious narrative is to happen soon. And and that's something I covered in my history of interpretation. This is something that's happening soon after he writes this. And now here we are 2,000 years on, right? In the final chapter alone, he indicates that these things must take place soon. 
22.6. Jesus himself says, I am coming soon, 22.7. Jesus, by the way, we have what he said in the Gospels too, right? Jesus again assures his readers, I am coming soon, 22.12. And says again, I am coming soon, 22.20. John urges him on, Amen, come Lord Jesus, 22.20. For John, Jesus was not coming 2,000 years later to rapture his followers out of the world. He was coming in judgment in John's own near future. Those who oppose him would be horribly destroyed while his followers would enter into a glorious city made of gold, which again, the early uh, church, especially um, Augustine among the early church fathers, did not like. Right? He thought that that uh, that was materialistic and Christians shouldn't be pining for that kind of thing and that they were already in the millennium. But that's where they would enjoy peace, joy, security, which for Augustine surely is already the case with the church, right? Uh, and security and the worship of God forever. And God would wipe away every tear. This is what the author says, and he probably really meant it, but in what sense, right? That's the question, in what sense? Yeah, and we kind of addressed this earlier, you know, that there's definitely, even for the author, this is definitely symbolic, and he's he's meaning something here. Now, we can discuss the violence a little bit more that we see throughout this book because this is definitely the most violent book of the New Testament, but probably competes for the most violent book in the Bible, right? And, you know, often we'll get statements from people like, oh, you know, there's the violent God of the Old Testament, but the God of the New Testament is is different, not as violent. But it's probably because they are excluding or, or not thinking or haven't read the book of Revelation in a while, right? There's a lot of violence happening here, and it's not just incidental violence. It's proactive violence that God is doing, or even in some cases might be instructing his people to do on his behalf. And so there's some problems here, uh, especially for you and me, Christopher, who are trying to approach this text with a nonviolent hermeneutic, with a beatitudinal hermeneutic where we're coming from the teachings of Christ that teach us to love our enemies and to do good to those who persecute us, and that Christ is the embodiment of the ideal that God calls us to. And so when we have a text like this that seems to be endorsing wholesale genocide, violence, whether it's something that is instructing humans to do it or whether it's something that is saying it's okay for God to do this because he's God, I think we have uh, an issue, right, with with taking this text and trying to uh, fit it into an understanding of of who Jesus is and who he's calling us to be, right? Yeah, there, there are so many fruitful questions, I think, that we can ask. And you know I love questions, Ben. I find more value in questions than in answers. Because I think what the answers, I think what answers do is they sort of end the conversation and the curiosity mm. is put aside for some kind of satisfaction, right? Which I think can be a false satisfaction that gives a false sense of security, right? So I'm just going to raise some questions, you know. So is this written by the same John who wrote the Gospel of John? Now, I'll give an answer. I'm not saying it's the answer. I don't think so. Does this text accurately portray the nature of God, which, you know, the prophet of the Restoration, uh, the Latter-day Saint prophet, Joseph Smith, says the first principle of the Gospel is to know the nature of God, right? To understand who and what God really is, to put it in my own words, right? And so I don't think this text portrays who and what God really is. Not if I compare it to the teachings of Jesus, right? It just doesn't make sense. And by the way, I can, as we come to an end of podcasting, you know, for two years on the Old and New Testaments, I can go back to the Old Testament and say, I don't think the Old Testament in many ways, you know, portrays God as he really is. And that's where our Christological hermeneutic comes in, our cruciform hermeneutic, the one that we borrowed from Greg Boyd from his book, Cross Vision, right? And that we added to, um, and when I say we, I mean you and, and Shiloh, really, right? Uh, you, Shiloh introduced me to Greg Boyd's work and 
and you and Shiloh were using not only Greg Boyd's hermeneutic, the cruciform hermeneutic, but also this beatitudinal hermeneutic, right? What is this? What are the central teachings of Jesus? And the central teachings of Jesus are in the Sermon on the Mount, and they don't square with this text, or this text rather doesn't square with those teachings. And so, what am I to do if I'm looking for who and what God is? I see Him embodied, right? personified, incarnated, which is just another way of saying embodied, but it's the theological term, right? In Jesus of Nazareth, in the Christ, right? In that example that he gives of how to be, well, we say Christ-like, but he's giving an example of how to be God-like, right? So what I see in the Old Testament isn't God-like. What I see in Revelation isn't God-like in that sense, right? And so what I can see is, For the Old Testament, I can see, especially given that some of what's included in it is of ancient date, right? Much more ancient date than what we're dealing with here, although some of the Old Testament is actually contemporaneous with this. And these are, again, this writing uh, that we call Revelation is very much in the vein of Jewish apocalyptic literature, right? That's between 200 BCE and 200 AD. I just don't see the same personification of God that I see in Jesus in these other texts, right? Whether it be some of the texts from the Old Testament or in this book of Revelation. And so I have to ask myself, which which God do I want to believe in? And I know that for some, you know, you don't have to pick between quote unquote one God and the other, right? That is one and the same and that I just don't understand that his ways are inscrutable, that he can be this violent, hateful enemy, right? And yeah, this violent, hateful, angry God, you know, the one that uh, that sinners are in his hands, right? Sinners in the hands of an angry God. I, I just don't see it. And, you know, in, in other contexts, I've heard it put where some version of God is explained to somebody that is incomprehensible. They just say, I just, I, I don't understand that. That doesn't make sense to me, right? That's not a God that I can understand or relate to in any way or have a desire to worship, right? You know, there are different ways and different interpretations and methods of approaching the book of Revelation. And we've given largely Ehrman's view. We we respect his commentary and, and his opinion. I've seen uh, other scholars that have done a very good job at going into the symbolism of of the book of Revelation, presenting it as something hopeful, symbolic, not literal, not necessarily advocating violence, only using it as a symbol. I do think there is something to the effectiveness of that. But at the same time, I I do ask myself a question of, is that the kind of effectiveness we want, right? Do, Do we want to persuade people to believe in God through a even symbolic threat of violence, right? And and I think that that isn't the right way to go, uh, so to speak, right? Here's another approach I can take, Ben. I can ask myself, am I reading this right? So maybe it's not the symbolism that you've just mentioned or at least implied, right? But maybe it's not the way I'm reading it. So I'm asking, you know, should I see what I see here as godly or Christ-like. But I don't have to ask that. I can ask rather, am I reading this right? Meaning, what I mean by that is, remember, we talked about the genre of this text, right? Mm -hmm. If we hadn't had that conversation of the genre, I'd be reading it differently still, right? So I'm, I'm actually reading it according to its genre, and I still am trying to come to terms with that, that what that genre is and what it does and what it means. And so I don't know that I'm actually reading it right. So that's another approach I can take. It is. That's a good point that, you know, as much as we try to approach a cultural context for this and enter into that mindset and see it through the eyes of the author and the intended audience, we are still removed from that in a degree to which we don't even necessarily know, right? And so the methods that we apply to understanding it often can can fall very short. I'm reminded of a couple of books that we've mentioned a few times, going all the way back to last year in the Old Testament, 
misreading scripture through Western eyes, misreading scripture through individualist eyes, those two books, yes. right? And even though we've read those books, and even though we're taking that into account, I can still ask myself, am I reading this right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, you asked me, Christopher, you you mentioned that you thought I should uh, share a story or at least an anecdote that came up in the past week from a friend on Facebook. Yeah, to put that in context, you know, over Thanksgiving break, right? I'm reading the millenarian world of early Mormonism, and I'm sending you all my commonplaces, and I don't even know if you're reading them. I assume you are. You're not really replying to them, right? And uh, we talked eventually, but I'm sending you all these commonplaces, the things that stood out to me reading the book. And all of a sudden, in the middle of that, you, you send me this message. Yeah. So this comes from my friend Honey, who was my roommate at BYU when I was in the Arabic foreign language housing. Now, Honey went to BYU to get a master's degree, and he's from Gaza in Palestine. Is he a Latter-day Saint? He's not. He's a Muslim. And as people are surely aware of the the recent uh, eruption in the conflict in Palestine, Israel, that has erupted, the fallout from this has been very devastating to many people. And in particular, uh, I am getting you know news from Hani from his family now. Honey, it lives in Washington D.C. He doesn't live in Gaza right now, but he does visit there from time to time and. Most of his family is there. And so Hani recounted the death of his brother, his brother's wife, and four of their children in an airstrike on their home in Gaza. And they were all killed and buried in the rubble. And they remained buried under the rubble because there's no one to dig them out. But I can't, I can't hear this story without it without it affecting me it's it pains me i don't even know honey he's your friend and this is just one example of of the suffering that's that's caused by this conflict that that again has as as a, at its root policies that are informed by a, what can be a misreading or an adversarial exegesis of a text that we called puzzling earlier, but that I'm going to say is a mystery if we're honest with ourselves. It, it's it's unconscionable. Yeah. I don't want to be a part of the violence that I see in this text. I don't wish it on anyone. I don't want uh, I don't want it to happen so that I can end up in a better place, whether material or not. I want peace. I want peace for, for me, for you, for our children, for those of Hani's family who survive, for Hani, and for all of the children of Israel and Palestine. That's my prayer. Amen. Amen. <laughs>